a classification problem, which we'll see in just a moment, we'll use a different kind of activation function called softmax, which will say, okay, each of these nodes, the total value of them is gonna sum to one. And we think of it as like a probability of which of these nodes represents the class that we're predicting. Yes, that's exactly right, Jess. The, the, there are activation functions in every single node of every single layer. And we use a special ones usually for the output layer because in the internal layers, what we're trying to do is build up useful information. Okay, and in the output layer, we're trying to say, okay, make a decision now. And so we have to choose an activation function that makes sense for the decision that we're gonna make. And often in regression, you'll just use a linear function because you want the value to be as big as possible or as small as possible, depending on your domain. And then softmax, which we'll talk about specifically in just a second for classification problems. Oh yeah, that's a good suggestion from George. And I'll try and read all the questions out loud from now on when I'm answering. So George said, please send the question to both the panelists and the attendees. And Dinesh, that's right. And, and we'll zoom in one more level even to help this all make sense. So some of you have clearly done some of the reading or some previous exploration of these topics and you're talking about weights and biases and how to train these things. So here's a view of the same neuron, but zoomed in one more layer. Okay, and remember, this is the image for every neuron in our neural network. All of the input values from the previous layer each neuron has its own weight for each of those individual nodes. So in our image, we have three nodes per layer, three neurons per layer, which means every one of those neurons has three weights for the three input values from the previous layer. And those are unique to that particular node. So this node has three weights. All the other nodes also have three weights. And they're not shared. Each neuron gets its own unique weights, okay? Those weight values are multiplied by whatever the input is from the previous layer, the nodes in the previous layer. And those multiplied or you know, weighted values are then what get sent to this sum operation. Okay. The sum operation also gets one additional input per neuron, which is called the bias. And the bias is optional. There are certain neural network architectures where they don't include a bias, but it's very common. It's almost always the case that this bias is added, okay? So I think this is a good time to let you think on a question for a second. What's the purpose of the bias? These weights, I think, kind of make sense. Do you want to be able to train this neuron to care about the inputs from the previous layers to a certain extent? You say, like, maybe weight zero becomes zero because this top neuron doesn't tell this neuron anything useful. And this weight might be a larger value because it thinks the middle neuron from the previous layer has a more useful signal coming into it, at least from this neuron's perspective. But what's the point of this bias? Think about that. Okay, I'll reveal it. Now, you've all had a chance. I hope you've all actually thought about it. You know, challenge yourself and then receive some correction or, or advice. Helps you learn. The bias is to help the neuron decide kind of in and of itself whether it's a useful signal. So each neuron, all of these neurons, you know, have their own place within the whole system. And giving them a bias helps this particular node adjust itself during the training process, irrespective of what these weight values and what the input values are. So these weights are kind of to help this neuron decide what information from the previous layer matters to me. And this bias is more about having this neuron decide what, how valuable is my signal and what should, what type of signal should I be sending? And then we sum all this up and we send it to our activation function, which again in this case is still the sigmoid function. And that types out, okay? And so these weights and the bias 
these are the parameters that are actually trained by our optimization algorithm during the training process. I think this is another good time to pause for questions. Okay, Dinesh, can you say more? Okay. So the bias is, is just like the weights in that it's a value that is changed over and over again during the training process to help the neuron learn how to handle the data that it keeps on seeing. As we train the network, data comes through, data comes through, and the weights and the biases are being adjusted to help to minimize some error function, the loss function we provide to our network. The weights modify input data from the previous layer, whereas the bias doesn't modify any data that's coming in. The bias is just isolated within this particular node. So the bias helps the node determine things irrespective of the incoming input data. It helps it tune itself in a way that isn't reliant on the previous layer's information. Is that helpful, Dinesh? Cool. Okay, Simran asked, is sigmoid then the weight of that neuron? Not exactly. It would be wrong to use the term weight because these nodes here are the weights. The output of this sigmoid function on this arrow is going to be the input to the next layer. And that next layer's weight value for that input will be you know, multiplied and then sent to the sum of the neuron in the next layer. But we, like, it's true that the output of the sigmoid function is the activation value of this particular neuron. But if we use the word weight in neural networks, we're typically referring specifically to one of these. Okay, awesome. Great questions. Anything else? Okay, groovy. Uh, is it always some? So we shouldn't say necessarily always. You can build neurons from scratch that do you know, all kinds of special things. In Kiris, yes, it's always the sum. We don't really have that much control over this particular node. We have lots of control over this node, the sigmoid function. We can change the activation function to be, you know, basically anything. We can write custom activation functions in Kiris. We won't do a lot of that in this class, but I'll point to some places where you might want to, especially when we're doing semantic segmentation. But we don't really have a lot of control in Kiris over this sum operation. And you know, that might be for good reason. The, the PhD researchers and Francis Chalet, who wrote the Curious Library, and all these people who've been studying deep learning for a long time have empirically shown that sum is a good and useful operation, that it usually does what we want it to do. OK, great question. Do we set and initialize the bias during training, or does the neural network decide and tune itself? So in almost all cases, when we make a new neural network for a new use case, the weights and the biases are set randomly. So they're actually chosen completely at random to begin. And then through the, the training process, they're slowly updated. So the way the training <clears throat> works in these things is we'll send, say, 32. We'll send one batch worth of examples all the way through our network. And we'll calculate the value of the error for those functions. So we'll specify a loss function that says, this is how we quantify how accurate our network was for those 32 examples or whatever, boom. We take that average value and we use gradient descent. So we compute the gradient going backwards and an algorithm called backpropagation to say, this is how wrong we were. And the gradient tells the bias and the weights which direction, up or down, to be adjusted in. And then each optimization algorithm, like if we're using stochastic gradient descent versus Atom versus um, Atomax 
or we'll look at a bunch of different activation functions in tomorrow's class, or not tomorrow, Thursday's class. But the gradient tells us which direction to update those things in, and we just make a small change up or down, and then we do another batch, boom, and come back and forth. But they start out as, as random, usually. And we'll see an example when that's not true, something called transfer learning in, I think, the fourth or fifth class. OK, Kamakshi, does bias got anything to false positive or false negative? Um, not necessarily. False positive and false negative are things that we can say about the predictions that their neural network makes at the output layer, but not necessarily um, this term bias in, in this context isn't talking about like the bias of the predictions. It's just talking about a numerical value that this particular node receives. So there is other language in the NL world, machine learning of you know, the bias and variance trade-off. And this node here is not talking about bias in that same context. And then there's also you know, human bias. We can be biased against certain things which cause us to make bad decisions. This term bias in this context is also not related to that term. So it's an unfortunate overloading of a, a term that's used a lot. Does that make sense, Kamakshi? I'm sorry that I'm probably butchering some of your names. I feel bad about that. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's kind of the component parts of a neural network. What I want to do next is build a neural network in Curious. Okay, so we're going to hop over to the next little section. And here we're going to import a toy data set, the MNIST data set. We're going to plot that data set so we can all look at some of the examples from the handwritten digits data set. We're going to do some classic machine learning things like split into test and training data and split into training and validation data and talk about what that means. And we're going to have this network train itself and kind of talk about all the little knobs that we can turn while we build neural networks. OK, so very, very exciting stuff. OK, so first thing we're going to do is you know, import matplotlib. This is a classic plotting library. You can see the documentation in the GitHub repo or you know, Google it, matplotlib docs, easy. And we're going to import a data set from Curious. So we're going to use lots of different built-in data sets. In the first two classes, we're going to be using MNIST a lot. It's a classic starting place for machine learning, but it's kind of too easy. I mean, you'll see even in this lab where we're going to make the some dead simple neural networks, we're going to be able to get 90 plus percent accuracy today in the first class on MNIST, which is amazing. You know, it's not something that we could do reliably 10, 15 years ago. And now anybody can do it in 30 minutes with off the shelf frameworks. This is how fast machine learning is, is pushing, pushing us forward, which I think is so cool. Okay. But there are some more challenging data sets that are built in. And later in the class, we'll also look at how to download and format our own data sets in on our machine and do machine learning without using like this really nice, clean, pre-built data, which is convenient for learning purposes, but is also not, not really representative of what machine learning looks like in the real world. You know, If all of our data sets were as clean as MNIST, we would be doing a lot more impressive things with machine learning already. We got a lot of problems that come from getting bad data. So this is a luxury. Enjoy this luxury. We just load the data with a function provided to us by Curious, and we split it into two kinds, training and test data. Does anyone already know the difference between training and test data? Want to unmute yourself and chime in? Pretty important. No, that's okay. Okay, so with machine learning, one of the biggest problems, and with neural networks in particular, one of the biggest problems is something called overfitting or you know, lack of generalization. Those are both 
two terms that kind of mean similar things. So one way to think about overfitting is, oh, great, yeah, we got an answer. Training data is used for training, and test data is reserved for evaluating the performance of a trained model, because if you're evaluating performance on the same data you trained on, you'll get unrepresentatively high performance metrics. Yeah, that's exactly right, because our, our models are capable of memorizing the incoming data, right? We have enough complexity in the series of neural network layers that every image, every